uh, this morning I want to share something with you that I have been waiting for uh, a few weeks to be able to share because uh, this is why it's on my heart. I want this to be a message that uh, some of us will look at and say, this is where I want my year to be. I want my year to be in this place of freedom. I want my year to be in this place of happiness that only comes through being where God wants me to be in his plan. And, you know, we make it too complicated. But I want to talk to you this morning about asking God for help. How many of you know that we can ask God for help? And, you know, he is not, uh, he doesn't turn a deaf ear to us when we ask him for help. Before we read the text, and while some of you are still giving, uh, I look back, Rita, is that you, Rita Franks? Are you sitting back there? Wave at me, dear. Uh, I'm going to re reference you, sir, by trying to see Rita. Wave at everybody so they can see you right there in the back. Her husband, Jack Franks, uh, passed away several years ago, and he was a diabetic. He, he was in the service. He was a good, hardworking man and, and overtaken by the diabetes, and uh, uh, he lost his eyesight. And, but just what a testimony of, of God's redeeming love in his own life, and he was just a joy. He was a joy, and, uh, but uh, bl blind as he was, he was very faithful. He and Rita in the house of the Lord, and uh, I'll never forget the night that we're standing in the foyer and I am uh, standing there listening to Jack as he is giving me a testimony of a real financial miracle that took place in their life. And I just rejoiced with them. And then he turned and he said, uh, Pastor, church is about to start. I said, church is about to start, Jack. I get to get in there. He said, well, would you help me in? And I said, well, sure. So he asked for my help. I said, I'll help you in. And I had books in one hand. I was going to speak. And and I had Jack on the other arm, and I'm leading him through those two double doors. We have two sets back there. Those doors back there, one, they both open out. They don't open in, okay? And as I was half-heartedly paying attention uh, and anxious to get in here, I've got Jack on one arm and books in the other, and the, one door is open and one door is closed. And you can see it coming. <laughs> I walked through the open door, and Jack hit that other door just as solid as possible. And I looked at, because there was no give in it at all, I'm telling you. And oh, I felt bad. I looked at him and I said, Jack, are you okay? While his eyes are rolling back in his head. And he said, I think I need to sit down, Pastor. And I helped him sit down on a bench right there. I mean, I, I didn't know if he's going to pass out or not. Boy, I, I, he hit that door hard. And, and you know, the bad thing about it, he was depending on me to help get him through the door and, and I walked him into the door. Are you following what I'm saying? And the story doesn't end right there. He was in the hospital in Kansas City, and one of my friends, I called up there that pastors Antioch Church, and their pastoral care guy went to see him and was talking to him. And one of Jack's first words when he knew he was my friend, Jack was a cut up. He said, yeah, Pastor Steve's my pastor. He tried to kill me. Did you hear about this? And <laughs> let's them in on the story. So it circulated all over. The, the blind leading the blind is really what it ended up as. My point is this, many people ask for help, and uh, do we really expect the kind of help we're asking for, because are we as attentive to those that are asking of us, or are they as attentive to us as we would want them to be when we are sincerely asking, I do need your help, I need your help. Uh, I've tried to be honest enough to let you know there are occasions that if you see if you see me on the side of the road with the hood up, it is a scream for help. It does not mean I know what I'm doing working on my car. No, no, no. I know nothing about it, but I am asking for someone to please stop and help me. So we're asking for help. Stand with me, if you will, and I want to take you to the scripture this morning, to Psalm 86. I love this. Boy, it's so honest and transparent. David writes... Bend down, O Lord, and hear my prayer. Answer me, for I need your help. Protect me, for I am devoted to you. Save me, for I serve you and trust you. You are my God. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I am calling on you constantly. Give me happiness, O Lord, for you give. I give myself to you. Now listen to this. Oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. And I am thrilled to declare to you that he is attentive to our request for help. 
He knows the urgency of it. He knows the measure of it. And he is willing to respond to us. It's never a half-hearted effort. It's never in vain when we ask him for help. He's willing to help us. Amen? May God add his blessing to our reading of his word. You can be seated. God is paying attention to us. And he is waiting for us to ask. Sometimes we are so proud that we do not ask. And we wait until all options are off the table and then we go screaming to God for help when all the time he has been waiting for us to ask him for help. You see, Psalms 27, 14 says, don't be impatient, wait for the Lord and he will come and save you. Be brave, stout-hearted and courageous. Say yes, wait on him and he will help you. But wait on him and he will help you. Impatience is one of the reasons a lot of people do not ask God to help them. Because we're wanting something in our time frame, in our way, and we're just absolutely taking him out of the equation. Now there's two things that I really want to impress on you in the next 10 minutes, okay? That's my message today. But two things I really want to impress on you about what God's nature is toward us and how he is willing to help us if we will just ask. The first is this, that the Lord will help us move from what is normal for us to what is best for us. Our norm, our normal has been established in our life by many, many things that have happened. And if we don't watch it, we will turn around and look at our norm as just the way it is because it is what it is. And we think it can't change. Well, the way it is does not have to be the way it will always be. God is wanting to move our norm because if we stay in that place of thinking, we will end up saying, well, that's just the way it is. And can I tell you, that's where bad theology is born as well. Where a lot of people were saying, well, it must be God's will because it's happening. Not everything that happens is God's will. You know, and people say, well, God always gets his way. I don't know that God always gets what he desires for us. If it really were that he did, then we would not be taught to pray by Jesus himself. Your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So moving us from what is our norm and moving us from what has become really a, 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 a in, in uh, how would you say it, entrenched in us, it's a default system that we just roll back into when other things seem to fail or don't happen the way we think they should or as quickly as we think they should, we will go back to this thinking. And I want to tell you, these things need to change so we can find what is God's best plan for our life and not what is just the norm that we have called acceptable. Psalm 42 verse 5 says this, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God and I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. Look at that real close. Asking the honest questions. Why is it that I am so discouraged? And why is it, excuse me, that my heart is so sad? And then he turns around in his thinking, he said, but I will put my hope back in God. Now that is not to say I have the resolve that I'm looking for, but I will put my hope in God because I know that is the place where I discovered my salvation. That is the place where I discovered this relationship with God. And that is something I can go back to and start building from that toward my future. Rather than just looking at the things that are happening now because I will find myself discouraged. I will find myself sad. And I got a good word for you. God wants you to be happy. That's all there is to it. God wants you to enjoy life. God wants you to enjoy the relationships you have. God wants you to excel in life and not be discouraged every day of your life. But many have said, well, that's just the way it is. And it's not going to get much better. Well, if we live in that attitude without moving forward from that place, we will never know the real joy and the real grace that he wants us to to enjoy in life. How it's important. One more time. The Lord will help us move from what is normal for us 
to what is best for us. Here's the second thing I want to impress on you today. And I think it's the key to everything. The Lord will help us forgive and move on. David's prayer in Psalms 83, as I just read to you, is based on perhaps the most important principle that there is in the Word of God, and that principle is forgiveness. Some people would say, well, the principle of salvation. Salvation is not possible without forgiveness. But the most important principle I believe, Steve Dixon believes, in the Scripture is forgiveness. It is the way of the kingdom life for us. It is the way for abundant life for us. It is the way for us to not be encumbered by the sins of yesterday and to move forward the only way we possibly can. Here's what it said in verse 5 that I read to you just a moment but a moment ago, but look at it again. Oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive and full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. If we ever get this in our mind, that he is more consumed with forgiving and loving us than we are receiving his love and his forgiveness. He is more about that for us than we are about obtaining that. And he has paid the price for it. Jesus taught us in his word in Luke chapter 6. You know this portion of scripture well, verse 37, 38. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others and it will come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift, everybody say your gift. I want to show you something. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and pouring into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now listen, there's a big principle here. Generosity in giving, both in material goods as well as love, compassion, and forgiveness of others will result in returned generosity to us. This is not just about money. It's about offering life. It's about offering forgiveness. It's about offering compassion. And then the example is given to us that it is, it, it, it is something that is pressed down, shaken together, and made room for more so that it can be running over and it can abound in our life. I want to tell you it is in the abundance of his grace that others are going to see the goodness of God. It's not just the sufficiency of, it is the abundance that is going to make the difference. Jesus did away with retaliation and the concept of demanding an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life, a recompense for wrongdoings. He did away with this whole retaliation system. So I don't know what we're waiting on if we think God is going to get on the bandwagon to return evil for evil. It's not going to happen that way. It'll never happen that way. Because God has dealt with that. We are instructed to bless those that even curse us. Amen. Amen. So it's very important for us to understand that the Lord will help us forgive and move on. And I've got to be quite honest with you and tell you, I know it preaches well, but it is very difficult for a lot of people to do. We are to love others, not judge them. We are to walk in forgiveness as we have been forgiven. And when I say walk in forgiveness, one of the keys is this. Learn to move from the place of just praying for forgiveness about a situation and learning to daily walk in an attitude of forgiveness. Amen. You see, it really helps me to pray and say, Lord, lead me not into temptation today. And some people say, well, is he going to lead me into temptation? No, but he knows the path I'm taking in life is going to be filled with temptations and there are things that are going to happen. There are opportunities for offenses. There are opportunities for unforgiveness that are going to be facing me along the way. And before I ever get there, I'm praying, Lord, lead me not in that path. Don't let me go down that road. But most Christians today wait until they are there and they're crying out for help. Now, I'm glad to tell you he will help us. But he is really wanting to change that paradigm and change that thinking that that is the norm and that's the way it's supposed to be to a better way that says before you enter into that place, let me lead you into a better place. 
Now, folks, if we really do believe that he knows the end from the beginning and he knows the activities of the day before we ever start the day, then why can't we ask him to orchestrate our steps today so that we will walk in the way of righteousness and the way that is pleasing to him? You want to have joy? Learn to be proactive in this relationship and not reactive in this relationship. But many are just reactive because we know we have a deep well to draw from of forgiveness and love and mercy that's new every day. And yes, thank God it's there. But let's move from just thinking that's the way this is supposed to operate to the place that says there is a better way where I can let the steps that I take be ordered of the Lord. And the scripture says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. So allow him to order our steps rather than us just being reactive to the place we find ourselves. You know, Paul put it this way. This is not in my notes, but I I, I, I want to detour just a second. In Romans chapter 6, Paul made it clear. He said, don't cheapen the grace of God by thinking, I will go ahead, I will do what I want to do, And then I'll ask God to forgive me because I know his grace is sufficient to forgive me of whatever. He said, don't do that. He said, what you don't realize, whom you yield yourself servants to obey, you become a servant to whom you yield yourself to obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. He said, it's a bigger picture than you just thinking God will forgive. He said, you are programming yourself to say, I'm going to go where I want to go selfishly rather than the selfless life and ask God to forgive me. He said, let, let, let's, let's just walk in the selfless life and not have to depend on. Thank God his grace is sufficient. But I'm glad that he is instructing us in a better way of living than just calling on him when we are in dire straits. But we know we walk with him day by day by day. Choose to forgive. Choose to forgive. Nothing is clearer in the Gospels than Jesus' command to forgive. Yet following his command is one of life's greatest challenges. But if we choose not to forgive, we are choosing to cheat ourselves of a lot of joy and happiness in life. When we live with resentment in our hearts, our resentment becomes the filter through which we see others and potentially even God. And there are many, 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 many people that I've talked to over the years that do not want to articulate and say it, but the bottom line is they are mad at God. How'd they get there? Oh, it's a journey of its own. It's a journey of its own. But we've got to get to the place where we are allowing ourselves to walk in forgiveness and His grace every day. You know, uh, I, I love to read historical things and especially things in my lifetime that I remember and I'm trying to refresh myself on all that happened and it was it was 1992 I was already away from Southern California matter of fact we'd already started the church here but the the uh, riots in Southern California that were happening in the Rodney King trial and for six days six eight days something like that there were riots in the street there were over 60 people 60 people I think that were killed and uh, something like 2,000 people that were injured. There was over a billion dollars worth of property damage. The vigilante aspect of that from the Korean community, the Hispanic community, everybody involved. It was, hate was just absolutely so thick in the air you could cut it with a knife. And not to get into all the aspects of that, but there is one name that's just kind of hidden in all that historical evidence of that day It is Reggie Denny. Do you remember the name Reggie Denny? After the trial is over, Reggie Denny is driving a truck through an area where the police would not even go because it's like a war zone, so we're staying away from it. And he is pulled, innocently, he is pulled from his vehicle, and he is on the street, and he is brutally beaten by a mob of people, and they would leave him for dead. Fortunately, he did not die. He lived. Uh, Reading more about him, he's lost hearing in one ear, most of the eyesight in one eye. But he was asked the question when somebody said, let's talk about it. And it came back up again on the 25th anniversary of 
the event and uh, he said, I just don't want to go there. I'm not going to talk about it. And they said, but it's important. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, sanitize our history. We've got to look at the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. So we make up our mind. We're not ever going to let that happen again. But he made the observation. He said, you know, I don't want to go there because I walked away from it and I have forgiven. I have forgiven. And I'm not going to live my life in unforgiveness and resentment. I'm going on. And I thought, oh, how great. Well, of course, the media is not going to be happy with that. They want to press for something more because that's not a good story, you know. But I tell you, one of the greatest quotes that I have ever heard comes from a man that I had grown over the years to have respect for. It was, it was um, after 27 years of being in prison in South Africa for participating in apartheid to come against the apartheid government there. Nelson Mandela made this statement. As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. And again, that's not what people want to hear because they like the stories. But here's what forgiveness does. Forgiveness allows you to move from the victim of your own story to be the victor in your own story. I refuse to go there. I'm free from that prison and I'm not going back to that prison here. But I'm going to live in freedom. Is anybody relating to this today? I'd love for you this year to have the greatest year and to be happier than you have ever been in all of your life and your family be happier than you've ever been in all of your life. And one of the greatest ways to do it is to say we are going to leave some things behind and we are going to move forward in the grace of God and through the gift. Oh, it was a gift. I said, remember that word gift? The gift of forgiveness. It's a gift he gives to us. It's an opportunity he gives to us to say, I forgive. Wow. I look across this building right now and I see some of you that 19, I mean, excuse me, 2000, I live in the Old Testament. Isn't that funny? <laughs> That's so funny. That's funny. But I stop and think about this, that 2017, you wouldn't want to relive that for anything in the world. I look through here at this audience and I see some of you that the deaths that happened, tragic deaths and things that occurred. But my prayer is this, that you will not let that sadness of heart become the norm that becomes the default in your life that you will naturally fall into when things are not happening just the way we think it should, but that we will move forward to a better way that God has for us. And I don't know the story of everybody in this building but I do know that all of us have our stories and all of us have our trials that can either make us or break us. And with God's help, let's move forward in the name of Jesus. Amen. He is so gracious to forgive. You know, I'm, I really am. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by a message like this because this is one guy standing before you that has just been given forgiven so much. People say, boy, you, you're, you're, you're a man of mercy. That's because I'm planting as many seeds as I possibly can. I just believe in this whole principle of generosity as giving this gift of love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness that God has given to us. Well, that's my heart. Just want to share it with you. Bow your heads with me, please, everybody. I asked this question in the first service, and I'm not going to put anybody on the spot other than as your pastor this week, I want to pray. And I'd just like to kind of take a picture in my mind and I'm going to pray because I think there are some folks that are ready to leave some things behind and move forward in this new way that God has for us. But if there's anybody in this building that you would say, Pastor, I received the word today and I am making a decision today that I am not going to let the bitterness, the resentment, the unforgiveness, the failures, whatever it may be, hold me back 
and tailor what my norm is supposed to look like. But I'm going for a better way and I'm moving forward in the name of Jesus this year. Would you see my hand and would you include me in your prayer? Not just now, but later on too. Lift your hand, let me see it, okay? And you can put them down, but while you're lifting them, I'm telling you that's why I preach this message today. So in the name of Jesus, Father, we're being honest with you right now. Every hand that was lifted is saying, I recognize this and I need to put this in your hands and I need to move forward in the name of Jesus. So hear my cry, oh God. Hear my cry, hear my request. And in your mercy and your grace and your love, <laughs> I choose to move forward today. And Father, for any individual in this building who has yet to say yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's the greatest step forward we will ever take. We pray, oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me, cleanse me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Oh, Father, thank you that we know you hear our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Stand with me if you will. Now, these altar rails are open and there will be people here to pray with anyone who desires special prayer. But there are Bibles and there's some information that I have prepared about what it means to be a follower of Christ that I'd love for you to take if you're interested in exploring that, having someone pray with you. If you just prayed that prayer, you desire to pray that prayer to know Christ as Savior, someone will be here to minister that to you and to help you in any way we possibly can. Thank you, thank you, thank you for receiving the word today and being in the presence of the Lord. I look for you back Tuesday night. Hey, let's pack this place for CR, okay? And uh, let's just have a good time together. Praise God. Now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all until we gather again in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.